Well, good morning. Um, that was actually a beautiful prayer to open with. Um, I am here this morning to talk about, I'm very grateful, um, to talk to you about childlikeness and gratitude. And I was asked to um, speak on this topic because I'm a child clinical psychologist. And so part of, I think, what enables my work is trying to tap in to what it's like to be a child. Um, and I also have three kids, and you're going to see lots of pictures of them today. I'm using, I'm definitely drawing from my experience with my kids today. Um, so uh, with each year, as I've moved from childhood, I've experienced a more difficulty experiencing gratitude in every moment of the day. And um, there's many reasons for that, and um, we're going to go through some of those as we talk about what it's like to have childlike faith and how that can lead us to gratitude. Um, but I think that an approach to life that lacks that sense of gratitude really took hold um, and has been a struggle since graduate school. Okay, so I'm speaking to many of you today. Um, I'm going to try and connect with, with that. So. Um, I don't know if this is your experience, but in my graduate training, um, complaining was a common practice, okay? Feeling overwhelmed and frustrated and like we don't have enough time in the day to get everything done um, to meet all the demands upon us was very typical experience. And, um, you know, the emphasis on analysis and thinking and not um, experiencing and trusting that God is guiding each step of this purpose for us, even if we're not sure what that is, um, is not a, it was not a typical thing. And definitely giving thanks in all things was not something that my gra fellow graduate students and I engaged in all the time. Um, so as I've moved from graduate school um, and gained more responsibilities and encountered more difficulties and have more uh, nuanced um, roles that I've had to navigate, I find it increasingly more important to focus on a childlike faith as the psalmist for our psalm of thanksgiving talked about today. Um, so my question is how do we give thanks even in the midst of difficulty, even when in despair, when burdened by responsibilities or overwhelmed by demands? Um, or if we want to phrase the question in another way, what keeps us from experiencing gratitude? Um, so the psalmist in this thanksgiving psalm talks about a childlike faith, and I'm going to talk about these three qualities today and how when we move from a recognition of our dependence on God and start relying on ourselves and our own initiative, and as we have difficulty in engaging in awareness on the present moment, and as we um, start questioning our trust in his loving kindness and his purpose for us, we can move away from a sense of gratitude. So I'm going to talk about what I've learned from my kids and also from my stepfather um, in my, my talk with you this morning. So um, those were my children. Um, I have three of them. Aiden is seven, Quinn is three, and then this is my youngest, Caitlin, who is now a year old. So that's um, her at birth. And it's very easy in infancy to see how children are fully dependent on the adults in their lives. Infants are not able to do anything on their own. Um, throughout childhood, it is the parents who are directing the child's development and um, you know, the child's uh, involvement in activities. And um, Kids do not miss this point. They are very aware of the capabilities that they lack. Okay? They know they can't make their own meal. They know that they can't drive themselves to their friend's house. They know their parents can say yes or no. Um, I have my three-year-old, Quinn, is very good at recognizing um, you know, that we can say yes or no. And he expresses it, I think, more so than my other two, um, his gratitude and his acknowledgement that he is dependent on us. So when we can't, he can't find his pacifier and we find it for him, he says, thank you, thank you, mama. Right? And when we say, um, he, I'm making dinner, he says, Mama, might I read a book with you? And I say, yes, Quinn, wait five minutes and I'll be in with you. Thank you, Mama! And he runs to the couch, right, waiting for me. And even when I say, I love you, Quinn, he says, thank you, Mama. It's not even I love you back, it's wow, this is such a gift. I can, I can receive this gift because I know I'm dependent on that, and it truly is a gift. Um, 
So why do we lose sight of our dependence on God? Um, well, we can start believing in and relying on our own strengths. In our culture, and especially in our graduate training, we um, you know, have uh, dependence on many things um, other than God. So we can't leave our house without our cell phones or our iPod, right? We'll turn back around to get those. I'm a big iPhone person, so um, I definitely will turn around for that. But also with the skills and training that you're receiving in in your um, graduate school, you come to think that these are the tools and the skills that are necessary for you to strive and strike out and become the professional that you're supposed to be um, and that you're learning to be. And so we start with more evaluation of these skills of our own and um, belief that we're the ones who are learning these things and gaining this knowledge. We can move away from our dependence in God and all of these things. Um, most of the times we do not even notice that we have gone out on our own until we are lost, okay? And as the psalmist said, he was in a place of despair and that's when he called out to God. And a lot of times that's when we call out to God. However, we are always dependent on him. Um, so all the psalmist could see was trouble and sorrow and he was directed not by God, but by the anguish of the grave. And we can have clouded vision because of this. Um, but he would recognize his dependence. And in reality, we all are always dependent on God. So St. Teresa of Lisieux um, talked about her, an image of salvation that she had, and I want to share that with, with you. She describes her salvation in this way. All of her life, she is a little girl. She is proud and happy to be a little girl. Her heavenly father is standing at the top of a great staircase, always beckoning her, come, Therese, come, I ask more of you. She lifts her little foot again and again by all her actions of her Catholic faith and religious life trying to please God. She is trying to climb up to God. God watches Therese and sees her desire to come. Then in one moment we call grace. God rushes down the staircase, picks her up, and takes her. She knows afterward by hindsight that God has done it from beginning to end. But it was important for her to keep lifting her little foot. Our struggle, our desire, our yes is significant and necessary, but in the end, it is always grace that carries us up the staircase. Um, we would change to the next slide. So the next um, quality I think is quite important um, when we think about a childlike faith is awareness in the present moment. So these are, um, the top two are my honey rock pictures. Um, and I'm going to give you a um, story from Honey Rock because um, I think that is a place um, locally that we definitely can be more aware and present focused. But children are by nature present focused and they can relate to God by their very being. They don't engage in any thought process. They don't have a knowledge base of God. Um, we're hopefully instilling that in them, but by their very being, they're connecting with him. And they can experience um, their feelings very intensely. So anyone who's hung out with kids for any amount of time knows they can be throwing an all-out tantrum at one moment and then jump up joyfully, you know, in utter glee and excitement about whatever you just told them. They're going out for ice cream. Okay, I'm done, you know, crying. So um, they really experience the present moment and their experience right then and there. They're not thinking about the past. They're not trying to plan out the future. Um, they are very present. So um, when we were up at Honey Rock this past summer, my son Aiden, that's him on the, what you guys write, um, he, that's three years ago, but we were walking to the cafeteria and it was cold and rainy when we were up there this summer for the first part of the week. And I also know that you're not supposed to be late to dinner in the cafeteria. So I'm sort of rushing us along and I hate being cold and wet anyway. So we're rushing along and um, Aiden is lagging behind just looking up at the trees and that's kind of Aiden. He's very attentive to what's around him but not what I want him to do. So he's walking along and um, I said, Aiden, what are you doing? He says, mom, look. And I said, okay, bud, we really have to get going. But mom, look. And I said, okay, what's up there, bud? And he looks up and he says, isn't it beautiful? It's like pearls. And the raindrops had collected on the end of the pine needles. And they were absolutely beautiful. And he was struck by this, the gorgeous 
you know, creation that was in, on display for him. And so we stopped and we looked at these raindrops and it really made the rest of our walk to dinner a whole lot nicer too. Um, but um, Donald Miller um, writes, I think he captures this well. He says, when you are born, you wake slowly to everything. Your brain doesn't stop growing until you turn 26. So from birth to 26, God is slowly turning the lights on, and you're groggy and pointing at things, saying circle and blue and car, and then job and health care. <laughs> this... The experience is so slow, you could easily come to believe life isn't that big of a deal, that life isn't staggering. What I'm saying is I think life is staggering, and we're just used to it. We all are like spoiled children, no longer impressed with the gifts we're given. It's just another sunset, just another rainstorm moving in over the mountain, just another child being born, just another funeral. Um, this this past summer, I'm going to tell give an example of how I saw this, and it's striking to me, and you'll see why. Though at first you might think this is kind of odd, but we were um, on our way out east for vacation. That's where I'm from, and um, I'm not going to talk about the beauty of the ocean or the beauty of the sunset because those are all striking, and we can see God um, in those moments. I'm going to talk about we stopped on the way and we got donuts. So my family is very odd. We eat very oddly. We have all sorts of food allergies. We never have wheat. We rarely eat dairy. Um, we drink soy milk. And so we stopped and we said, okay, we're going to get donuts. So we got chocolate glazed donuts. Well, the boys sat there with what you would think was like the Willy Wonka chocolate bar, you know, with the gold certificate in it. They sat there and just devoured these donuts. It took them a good half an hour to eat the donut, each of them. And um, Aiden just kept saying, these are good donuts. And, and Quinn's going, oh, good glazed, Mama. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and just is so excited. They didn't take donuts for granted. Now, how many of you, when you eat a donut, scarf it down, right, without recognizing how amazingly good this tastes, right? Um, so we, we often take things for granted, especially if we're not paying attention in the moment. So how do we regain our gratitude for the daily things, the daily moments of each day? Um, well, we need to have moment by moment attentiveness um, to God's presence, and he's always with us. He's always here. Um, Henry Nouwen writes, Contemplation is a careful attentiveness to the one who dwells in the center of our being, such that through the recognition of God's presence, we allow God to take possession of all our senses. Through this discipline, we awaken ourselves to the God in us and let God enter into our heartbeat and our breathing, into our thoughts and emotions, our hearing, seeing, touching, and tasting. It is by being awake to this God in us that we can see God in the world around us. The great mystery of a contemplative life is not that we see God in the world, but that God within us recognizes God in the world. So instead of trying to make sense of things, instead of being outside of experience and trying to be in control or um, predict the future or ruminate on things that have happened in the past, um, if we could just allow ourselves to experience through all of our, ses our senses how God is present with us, we would be led to gratitude in all circumstances. So what the psalmist uncovers um, in, in the psalm that um, he expresses to us and also um, it, with crying out to God is that God is here and present. He will bend down and be attentive to our calls, that um, he is fully kind and loving. So children also expect to be loved. They expect to be heard. But as with the psalmist, they need to experience this being heard um, and responded to. And this creates a sense of security and trust. So this is um, Miss Caitlin. And I honestly, I almost just wanted to make this my point so I could show this picture. I love Caitlin. I think she's just beautiful. So that's her on the playground. Um, and for me, with all three of the kids, it's been very striking, this sense of security and trust that I see on the playground when I'm with them. Because as they um, get older and start trusting us, they can venture further from us when we're at the playground. 
So, and you can see it if you go week by you know, to week with them, they'll start taking further steps away from you. They'll try out new things. They'll, you know, Caitlin's a little impulsive. She'll, you know, throw herself down the slide. Um, but she first looks to see if we're there. Um, and in this picture, you see a moment where I captured that. So she walks out and she'll turn back to see if we're looking at her. And she's not turning back because she's a afraid or worried that we're not there. She fully expects me to be watching her and for my eyes to be on her. And in that moment, she experiences such joy and gratitude and just lights up because we're looking at her, because we are there and making sure she is safe. Um, so we might not have always in our human relationships um, had our trust fulfilled. Okay, and I will admit I have failed to live up to my kids' trust all the time. But we are able to trust in the Lord and trust that his love will always be found if we turn around and look for his face. Um, and that really is the beauty of our relationship with God and how it's different um, from our relationships with others. Um, so what are the obstacles that keep us from looking back um, at God's face? What are the obstacles that you experience um, that keeps you from being aware of his presence in the daily moment, um, from trusting him in each moment, from experiencing the joy in your relationship with him, your heavenly father? Um, this is my stepfather, Peter Kelso, and um, my mother, Arlene, married him um, 28 years ago. My father died when I was three, and so a couple years after that, um, this man became my father. And he was, during my childhood, a very angry and harsh man. He was fiercely independent, which made him quite successful at business and other activities that he engaged in. Um, but he was also quite judgmental. He did not trust in the goodness of others. And he had not trusted in God's goodness since his father had died when he was 14 years old. Um, five years ago, he had a heart attack and survived. Four years ago, he, lost, he started to lose function of everything below his waist due to what we found out was Lyme disease, um, and now he uses a wheelchair. Um, and he's become softer and more open to relationships during that time, and I really feel like this has been a process for him. Well, two months ago, my mother called and told me that he has lung cancer, and he's expected to live you know, six to 12 months with chemotherapy. So amazingly, um, my stepfather's been walking in a path of gratitude, and it's not anything that we would have expected. When I spoke with my mother um, just a few weeks ago, she said, you know, if, I, if you had told me that I would have learned about thankfulness and humility um, from Peter Kelso, I would have laughed at you. And um, it really has been an amazing process, and I want to share with you a little bit of that. He um, started a blog called Pete's Thanks, um, and I'm going to read you two parts, um, two entries. One is from his first entry when he has described his lung cancer. And he ends the entry with this. I can only say thank you because 20 years ago I would have had to say goodbye. I know these things. I have lots to be thankful for and I haven't said it enough. I intend to catch up. My father and his brothers died young and didn't get half the chances I did. I need to appreciate what I've been given, especially all that has exceeded my expectations. In another entry, in which he's talking about the effects of the medical treatment that he's undergoing, we can see his childlike dependence, his trust, and his present awareness. And in, actually, in the words I read to you, you can hear um, how some of them are childlike. Um, Thanks for the day, a good one with stuff done and put to rest. A little tricky last night. I foolishly let myself get dehydrated. The result was back pain and very dark urine. I started thinking about all the horror stories I've heard about congestive heart failure and how the kidneys shut down from lack of blood pressure and the result is frequent dialysis while the decline accelerates. Worry, 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 and fret. Things I've never been very good at. After an hour of this, I began to think again. I could use a drink. I'll call out to Arlene and warn her I think I'm dying. Arlene's my mother. I'd hate to surprise her with this mystery ailment in the morning. I'm not close to thanking God enough for Arlene, but here's a prime example of why I need to. I'll call out to her in the middle of the night, and she will magically appear on my side of the bed, wide awake and alert in a matter of seconds, asking, what's wrong, hon? That's when I have to fess up and tell her my pee-pee is too dark. 
She will immediately go into the bathroom and return with a glass of water for me. Then she'll ask if I want more and get it when I say yes. Then when I'm done being a baby, she'll crawl back under the covers, grunt goodnight, and forget what a jerk I was to ruin her night's sleep. So I thank God for this day, which started about 2 a.m. Thank God I didn't wake her. Thank God I got my own water. And thank Arlene for bringing me more when she got up. And once again, I thank her for being there, ready always to hold me up. So here's a man who's now in a place of despair. He's faced with his own death. My dad, the once independent man, is now dependent on others. His doctors, my mother, his body, in ways that he has never been before. Um, he has experienced their presence and their kindness. And he has chosen to trust them, to trust the process, and to trust God. Um, he is wanting to experience every moment that he has left. Even within the larger context of facing death, and I think this is really the just miraculous and amazing thing, he's giving thanks for the small details. He's not expecting to live. He's not expecting to, um, you know, recover from this really, you know, terrible lung cancer. Um, he is giving thanks for a glass of water and for his wife being responsive to him. Um, he's teaching us all about gratitude. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Ephesians that we are God's dear children who are so loved that Christ sacrificed his life for us. Um, we should not be fooled by the whims and passions and all the difficulties we encounter in the world, but rather we should give thanks to God. Paul writes that as God's children, we should be dependent solely on him and fully aware of and trusting in his love. We should make the most of every opportunity. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.